My wife told me to go onto the workshop and make myself useful. So, here I am playing video games. It might not look like much, but this is perhaps one of the most consequential things I've done in my life. Computers have existed for a long time, but the way we engage with computers has gone through many dramatic changes as humanity entered into the digital age. The first fully electronic, digitally programmable computer is 80 years old and was used during the Second World War to break ciphers. Following the war, this new and exciting technology attracted a lot of interest. Adoption was initially slow, however, due to the sheer size, complexity and cost of these early systems. And it wasn't until a decade later that the IBM 650 became the first commercially successful, mass-produced digital computer with some 2,000 systems sold. Demand far outstripping early projections in part due to a large discount offered to universities and the fact that it was compact enough to fit into a single room. As demand for computers steadily grew, an ever larger group of programmers emerged to develop software for them. But with increased demand also came increased cost. Buying a computer for every user wasn't yet an option, so corporations and institutions started to think of ways access to their computers could be shared. Experimentation is underway to develop a new technique of computer usage called time sharing. At consoles like this one, located in laboratories and offices throughout New England, hundreds of people will one day be able to use tomorrow's computer simultaneously. This new norm of connecting multiple terminals to the same mainframe computer, or time sharing, is how many early users worked with computers. With time, improvements in manufacturing technology and integrated circuit design meant that instead of filling an entire server hall, you could fit a whole central processing unit and all its supporting hardware into a neat little box, the appropriate size for a desk with all the performance necessary for your average office. It was the 80s and the personal computer was born. With its introduction and widespread adoption, the previous paradigm of mainframe systems accessed through client terminals became largely obsolete and personal computing entered the mainstream not just for office workers, but also home users. However, as more and more people find greater value in portability rather than just raw performance, desktop computer sales have been steadily losing market share over the past decades. What is curious is, given that the most common usage patterns we see today, with people making exclusive use of their laptop or smartphone as an HTML5 reader to access internet services, we have effectively returned to the mainframe and terminal model of half a century ago, with the only practical difference being instead of booking a time to access a terminal in the computer lab, we're now connecting to the mainframe wirelessly directly from our pockets. But in this era of resurgent centralized computing with big tech delivering content and services through monthly subscription models, I found myself asking the question, what if I could do all that by myself? Would it be possible to share the performance of a single personal computer between multiple users? Could a normal person apply the same basic principles that form the backbone of businesses that stream movies, games, or even a full desktop themselves? Well, yes, you can. If you want to allow multiple users to play video games, watch movies, or do actual work, on a single PC at the same time, there's a couple different ways to go about it. One solution is to use multi-seat software like Aster that will allow multiple users to be logged in simultaneously to Windows, but the most common solution is to create some form of virtual desktop interface where each user is assigned their own operating system and a slice of the host computer's resources. Craft Computing, Linus Tech Tips, and Level 1 Techs are channels here on YouTube that have accomplished this, each following a slightly different design philosophy. Virtualization comes with many benefits compared to multi-seat configurations. You're able to create and store save states of your virtual machines that you can revert to at will, 
privacy of individual users can be guaranteed, and there is no risk of user error causing problems for the host or other users. There is, however, one obvious downside, and that is that each virtual machine requires its own discrete GPU if you're not prepared to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars for enterprise compute cards and then even more for licensing costs. Also, with traditional VDI implementations, the enterprise GPUs they require have no video outputs. What you have to do instead is compress the video signal and send it over a network to a thin client, which is really just a small PC that is given access to your VM and decodes the compressed video signal. All these steps introduce latency, and while you can get it working really well, thin clients also come at a cost not far below that of a regular computer. They are, after all, just regular computers, only built to be more compact. Now, let's say you're a small business and you want to take advantage of the benefits of virtualization. Keeping all your mission-critical work in encrypted environments within the system you control yourself and can access locally without having to rely on some off-site managed service with an ISP acting as the middleman. You'd be looking at spending in excess of $100,000. If you speak to any IT professional, they're likely to tell you that pricing out a VDI system for anything less than 100 users is madness and that the only reason for doing so would be to take advantage of the security and management features. Returning viewers will have learned by now, though, that I'm the kind of person who tends to find solutions that lie orthogonal to established wisdom. And I'm quite happy to tell you that, yes, in this world of false dichotomies, there is indeed another alternative. A third position, if you will. So going back to my workshop, this right here is a VDI terminal. And while I'm playing a game here, there is another game running on the TV in the living room. Oh, and Forza Horizon 5 is also running in 4K upstairs, all on one GPU with nothing being compressed and streamed through my ISP. I don't even have a landline connection, so something like Parsec wouldn't even be an option for me. If I wanted access to the kind of performance I've got here in my workshop and living room, either by building a standalone PC for each location or turning to one of the established VDI solutions available on the market today, I would have had to spend 10 to 20 times the amount I did, if not more. This terminal cost me less than $200 to set up. That's including everything you see in terms of hardware and software, and a couple things you don't. What I've done here is by leveraging VMware's products in a novel way, I've created an on-premise VDI solution at a fraction of the cost of traditional systems, bringing total cost of ownership down by 90% or more, which makes it not only price competitive to the point where it is the obviously superior option to all other compute solutions for small or medium-sized businesses, but even means it's an attractive option for multi-user home environments, like mine. If you're an IT consultant, imagine instead of trying to convince an entrepreneur of the benefits of virtualized computing, despite the cost, you could be offering them all the benefits of virtualized computing while also delivering cost savings. The concept I've developed here is the only solution able to compete dollar for dollar with the bottom of the barrel business PCs while outperforming them. Here's an example. The total cost of an install in an office environment for 10 users, each with access to 4 plus cores, SSD storage, and accelerated graphics, would come in at less than $15,000, including all the individual user terminals and all software licenses. The annual operating expenses, excluding electricity and any maintenance requirements, would be zero dollars. Looking at an equivalent system using VMware's TCO calculator for their traditional offerings, the figure they give me is $70,000 for the install and $20,000 in annual operating expenses. And that figure is excluding user terminals and Windows licenses. Just to be clear, I am in full compliance with all licensing terms. I'm not breaking any of the rules set by either Microsoft, VMware, or NVIDIA. I've uncovered an edge case none of them seem to be aware of. 
Maybe this video will result in Nvidia giving everyone code 43 errors again. I don't know. I can't control what they do. But my solution is also platform agnostic. I could just as well use an AMD GPU here and base the system on functionality found natively within Windows. VMware's software stack is just much more convenient and requires less layers of workarounds to achieve these results. Now, VMware. I'm at a crossroads in my life where I'm changing careers, and I've got an offer to make. What you have created is an absolutely incredible software, and what I've been able to do with it for the past four years doesn't just mean every small and medium-sized office environment has now become a sales opportunity for you. If brought to full maturation and marketed cleverly, it'd mean every small and medium-sized office would be a guaranteed sale. If I were to simply turn this loose, it would generate millions of dollars in added sales for you. How would you like to turn that into billions?